American Football is an Audible original podcast produced by the History Channel, Misher Films, and Smack Entertainment. I'm Michael Strahan. For a decade and a half, I was the defensive end for the New York Giants. I hold the record for the most sacks in a single season and helped the Giants win Super Bowl 42. 2014, I was elected to the Pro Football Hall of Fame in Canton, Ohio. Now, I played football for most of my life, but I'd never heard this story before, and I bet you've never heard it either. It's one that reaches back into the past to explain the dirty, bloody, tumultuous origins of an American love affair. But this isn't some dusty, sepia-toned account of corporate boardrooms and ink-stained balance sheets. This is a story centered in the very beating heart of the American dream, with hard scrabble characters whose visions and ambitions were as large as the country that created them. This is one of the greatest football stories ever told because without it, there is no New York Giants, no Super Bowl, no Pro Football Hall of Fame. This is the unbelievable true story of the rough and tumble origins of the National Football League. The first chapter of this story begins in Canton, Ohio, where pro football was born and where pro football almost died. And to tell you how it all happened is my friend Kate Mara, who as the daughter of not one, but two historic football families, knows a thing or two about the legacy of the game. Welcome to American Football. Chapter one, Canton, Ohio. Americans love football to play it, and to watch it. More people watch football than any other sport. Even in places without college or professional teams, entire towns build their civic calendars around the Friday night lights. And football rakes in more money than any other professional sport. Just look at the Super Bowl. This one game is the most spectacular and the most watched drama in this country every single year. For many of us, sitting down on a fall Sunday afternoon during football season to watch a couple of games is a long-standing family tradition. It's woven into our national fabric, our families, our story. But that's the America of the 21st century. Things weren't always this way. Yeah, in trouble, he's gonna be sacked, no, gets away. He runs, gets away again. It is up! It is! No good! The Eagles pick it up and Herman Edwards runs it in for a touchdown! Bradshaw running out of the pocket, fires it downfield, and it's caught out of the air! The ball is pulled! Alan Amici has scored the touchdown, and the bottom of the pole are the professional football champions of the world. That's the end of the game. Football, or at least something that resembles it, has been around as long as the ancient Romans and Greeks. At its most simple, one person, controlling a ball of some sort, moves downfield towards a goal while others try to crush him. In the Middle Ages, soldiers were even known to play with the decapitated heads of their vanquished foes, which is pretty gross. And through the years, the sport was insanely violent. This is Chris Willis, NFL Films head archivist. Well, the sport always has a rough and tumble aspect to it from the very beginning. Nobody wore equipment. You didn't have shoulder pads and you didn't have helmets. Definitely a brutal sport. Here's former NFL tight end Tony Gonzalez. I can't imagine playing without pads. They'd probably have two series and then everybody would be carted off the field. Players regularly flung dirt. They bit and punched each other, gouged each other's eyes, stomped on each other, and gang tackled nearly every single play. Players died regularly. From the hits, to the tackles, to the pile, it was bloody. It was dangerous. But as this warlike game takes hold among the country's young men, the actual violence of wars being fought on American soil are fading into history. And the country is changing. When the Civil War ends in 1865, the United States is still considered a developing nation. 
But boy, do things change fast. By 1900, America is the world's most dominant industrial and agricultural power. Americans are dug in on both coasts, straddling a nation of, according to the lyrics of a brand new song, purple mountain majesty and amber waves of grain from sea to shining sea. U.S. cities are now humming with electricity and people are trading in their horse and buggies for cars. Tens of millions of European immigrants are arriving on crammed steamships and flooding into what will later be called the Rust Belt. And the indigenous people who still remain have been herded onto ever-shrinking reservations as new settlements expand all around them. No one knows that the horrors of World War I are just 14 years away. To many of America's young men, it seems as if there are no more battles to fight, no more lands to conquer, no more adventures to be had. Their fathers made their names and careers on the battlefield, but the generation coming of age has no such options. So these young men, looking for a fresh way to bloody their knuckles and prove their worth, find it in a new sport football. Chris Willis, the head archivist of NFL Films. The origins of football began uh, in the late uh, 1800s and early 1900s, and uh, it's sort of a mix of rugby and soccer. And um, mainly on the East Coast, you had prep schools and colleges uh, that sort of absorbed the game into their curriculum. You know, what we now know as American football it was uh, made up of four Ivy League schools, you know, Harvard, Princeton, uh, Yale, uh, and Columbia. Here's historian Clay Jenkinson. These are the wealthiest, most privileged, the whitest people of the country, and it was part of the formation of young men. The football being played at Harvard and Yale today would be unrecognizable to those in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. For one thing, each team fielded two dozen players at a time. And here's the thing, no one ever threw the ball. Movement down the field and scoring was done entirely on foot. Also, there were no fixed rules. Each college played the game their own way and temporary guidelines had to be hammered out before each and every game. Here is Hall of Fame coach Bill Parcells. It was chaos, but it was kind of an organized chaos that uh, both teams were gonna at least attempt to play by the same general set of rules and regulation. Football was mock warfare. This is Washington Post journalist and author, Sally Jenkins. It's a game about moving other people out of the way. It's a game of power. Some people call it war without death. Football was more than a sport. It was a critical American ritual, especially for the young men at America's Ivy League universities. To these men, Football was not a game for the lower classes or for immigrants. But that didn't stop working class America from wanting to try the game on for size. You've probably never heard of Stark County, Ohio, about 100 miles northeast of Columbus. Founded by German immigrants at the turn of the 19th century, the county boasted a bunch of lumber yards and sawmills which supplied incoming settlers with all the timber they needed to build their new lives. Few passing through this area today recognize its importance to football. Yet it's here that the NFL built the Pro Football Hall of Fame in 1963. And there's a very good reason why. Here's Joe Horrigan, the executive director of the Pro Football Hall of Fame. The professional game really began with the amateur athletic associations that were kind of gentlemen's clubs in major cities. Athletic clubs were exclusive, private establishments founded by the city elite to ensure business and social networking could mix effortlessly with physical exercise. You could only join through a strict vote, and the facilities were not open to the general public. However, as more and more wealthy clubs began competing against each other, particularly in the wild game of football, the desire to win trumped their notorious exclusivity. They began to admit talented players who never would have been considered before because they didn't come from the right families. Other underprivileged players who still couldn't gain admittance to athletic clubs found a place with local businesses eager to sponsor new teams. Here's Chris Bevan, the sports editor of the Canton Repository newspaper in Ohio. 
you know, a lot of them weren't from those types of schools. A lot of them may not have even played in college. Uh, you know, they just were, were working at, at jobs and, and this was something they were doing in their off hours. This was not something you were going to make a living at. Breweries and cigar shops, subsidized motley crews that usually played their games on Sunday mornings when most decent people were away at church. For many of the players, football was a release valve, a way for working class America to temporarily lose themselves in something other than the challenges and hardship of their daily lives. Paying players was not allowed, so clubs lured participants with expensive gifts instead. Joe Harrigan. There were uh, ways of getting around the overt handing out of cash. Sometimes watches were presented as trophies that were quickly pawned and exchanged for cash. Oftentimes, the athletic club would merely purchase the item back from the pawn shop and start the cycle all over again with the next player. While these practices were frowned on, it was more or less an open secret. Football, as it was being played outside the university system, was a vicious and lawless sport. But its fans were growing. Chris Bevan, again. The professional level, the, the heart of football was really Ohio. That's where a lot of those teams were located, and then it kind of branched out from there. Of all the football teams popping up across the country, the best are rooted in the unofficial Ohio League, working-class towns far from the hallowed university halls that gave birth to the game. For people in towns like Akron, Portsmouth, and Dayton, Football was the physical embodiment of day-to-day -day struggles that shaped so many industrial towns throughout the Midwest. Here's former NFL quarterback Ben Roethlisberger. In Ohio, especially early on growing up, football was, was everything on the weekends. You, you got through school so that you could play football on the weekends. All these great teams in Ohio would play each other, but it was loosely affiliated. Chris Willis, again. There, there was no rules or regulations. There wasn't, you know, standings. There, there wasn't contracts. There were just, oh, it's the Ohio League, and whoever ended up at the end of the season with the best record, they would be declared champion. Canton, a key center for iron production, was the largest and most prosperous city in Stark County. Between 1880 and 1900, its population doubled. If you look at Canton back a century ago, it was a city that was growing, a lot of industry, a lot of you know jobs related to steel. The city was bustling with energy. A mere 11 miles away, poor working class Massillon, known for its steel business and agricultural manufacturing companies, was Canton's natural rival, but it was more economically depressed and lacked Canton's industrial swagger. Here's Chris Bevan, Joe Harrigan, and Chris Willis. The old city with a lot of immigrants, a lot of people that were working the blue collar jobs. So, uh, you know, the focus was just on what's going on within their community and, and in their jobs and in their family. And then you had the distraction of, of football, of something to do outside of the workplace and, and, and a game that was growing and, you know, brought together all kinds of skill levels. People wanted the sport, but there wasn't major college football that they would uh, embrace. So they created the town teams. Well, in those early years, the lifeblood mainly was small town rivalries. For the most part, it was one small town, you know, Canton against one small town, Maslin. Here's Ben Roethlisberger again. Yeah, I, I mean, I know about Canton and Maslin. Talk about the rivalries. Uh, it's a cult following in itself. You had a lot of mobility between the cities. People worked at the same factories, but one lived in Canton, one lived in Maslin. People may have gone to pray at the same church on Sundays. So I think you just had the, the closeness of those two communities with each city being on the rise at that point. One of the biggest football rivalries uh, in America started in 1896. Although Massillon had fielded amateur teams drawn from local players for more than a decade, it could never compete with the wealthier, more populous Canton. Season after season, Canton humiliated Massillon on the football field. If you look at any list of all-time NFL champions, you, know, you see the 49ers, the Steelers, the Packers, the Patriots. If you go way back into the beginning, there's the Canton Bulldogs. On September 3rd, 1903, everything changed. 35 Maslin businessmen met at a local hotel, pledging to level the playing field. They were done being Canton's punching bag. They got together and just said enough is enough. You know, we are going to, you know, have to build a team that can be competitive. The core of the team was drafted from local talent. Ed Stewart, the young and ambitious editor of the Maslin Evening Independent, would be its new coach and quarterback. The new halfback was a local attorney. 
One of the new guards was a local cop, even though he'd never touched a football before. But not everyone was local. And these new guys weren't going to do it for free. Joe Harrigan and Chris Willis. They responded in 1903 by bringing in what would have been called ringers. They would come in maybe Saturday night, you know, or Sunday morning, learn a few plays, play that game, and then they would be on the next train out to their town to where they would go and play another game. They were not former college players. These guys were sandlotters. So their their brand of football was probably a little more rough. You know, the sportsmanship and quality of amateurism, they lacked all of that. Amateurism was absolute, and everything outside of the amateur realm was considered downright evil. By paying players, Massling could no longer be considered an amateur team. Their decision changed the course of the game forever. They created something entirely new, professional football. And they were playing for money, and they were playing hard. Here's former New York Giants quarterback Eli Manning. I mean... No face mask, the amount of teeth getting knocked out, nose getting broken, uh, you can't imagine. Uh, not a whole lot of protection going on there. It's another, another reason to give them credit for tough and, and, and playing that style. By the time the Maslin businessmen left the hotel that fateful Thursday, they had formed one of the top teams in the state, and they had a new name, the Tigers. Right out of the gate, the Tigers did things differently. For one thing, they practiced. Amateur players who worked at a factory job for 12 hours a day didn't have time to train. Here's Bill Parcells. Without practicing, it would be very difficult to be very efficient. They wanted to get their investment to be more prepared for the Sunday games. The Tigers dominated the 1903 season. When they squared off against the Canton Athletic Club, they finally crushed their longtime rivals. In their first official year of existence, the Maslin Tigers easily captured the Ohio League Championship. The town of Maslin was euphoric. But Canton and the rest of the league were furious. They were especially angry about Maslin ruining the purity of the amateur game. Again, Chris Bevan. If everybody's thinking it's going to be kind of a community-based league and you're bringing in people, that's going to start to ruffle some feathers. But without a governing organization making the rules about how the game should be played, there was no one to appeal to. In the end, the other teams realized that if they wanted to remain competitive, they had little choice but to follow in Maslin's footsteps. Joe Harrigan. Canton decided they're not going to sit back and just play dead here. We're going to develop our own pro team. This now kind of opened the floodgate, said, all right, we're here to play pro football. By the beginning of the 1904 season, at least five other teams, including Canton, began openly recruiting and paying out-of-state players. Desperate teams were willing to employ anyone who could play, regardless of creed or color. Black Americans, Native Americans, it didn't matter. The only thing that mattered was winning. So all of a sudden, now you've got two neighboring teams that are both declared to be professional, and the Canton folks dropped the gauntlet so that uh, they said the specific reason they were turning pro was just to beat Maslin. Canton and the rest of the new pro teams were determined to put Maslin back in its place. It didn't work. Maslin repeated as league champions. For football purists, these new out-of-state mercenaries whose only allegiance was to the cash in their wallets were ruining the game. And not only were teams now paying players from around the country, they were also stealing them from nearby universities. Just like now, college players weren't allowed to get paid for their skills. But that didn't stop college stars from playing under assumed names. The Shelby Blues new quarterback went by the name of Jimmy Murphy. But it didn't take the reporters long to realize that Jimmy was actually Peggy Parrott. At just 24, George Peggy Parrott was already a three-time All-Ohio College star, a born leader with a will to win matched by few others. Self-confident to the point of arrogance, Parrott knew his worth and wouldn't play for less than he felt he deserved. He was involved in playing some professional games and got caught. The university had no choice but to ban Parrott from playing any sports for Case Western. But a loss for the college was a win for the pros. His professionalism, you know, cost him his amateur status. But he then went into, you know, the pro game. So he became a powerful force in the very early days. As the 1905 season began, the Canton Athletic Club strengthened their roster with a new coach. 
a flamboyant and cunning former player named Charles Blondie Wallace and a half dozen out-of-town ringers. Reading down their stat sheet, they looked every bit as intimidating as their arch rivals. That season, Canton obliterated their six opponents by a combined score of 409 to zero. But when it came time to finally face their rivals, the Maslin Tigers triumphed yet again, winning their third consecutive championship. Here's Bill Parcells. Football's a very humbling game, and there's always someone out there that can get the measure of you. Only with the hindsight of history does it feel as if everything, all the blowout games, the rogues gallery of working class players, and the civic boosterism that powered it, had been leading inevitably to 1906, one of the most crucial and significant years in the history of football. Canton and Maslin had really put a lot of money into the pro game, and it wasn't gonna be sustainable. There was a story printed in the Cleveland Plain Dealer suggesting that Canton did not have the wherewithal to meet its payroll. Now that could well have been true, but that was done uh, for the sole purpose of discouraging better players going to Canton. Canton fans smelled a rat in Ed Stewart, Maslin's coach who was also, if you'll remember, the editor of his city's newspaper. Canton's retaliation was, in a word, inspired. And as a result of that, uh, Blondie Wallace and the Canton management recruited Maslin players to play for Canton to just say, well, I'll show you. Not only will we pay our players, they will be your players that we're paying. After raising $9,000 from local businesses, equivalent to a quarter of a million dollars today, Canton coach Blondie Wallace literally bought four key Tigers, including their quarterback. Replacing even one of these players was going to be difficult for Maslin, but all four? To fans, it appeared that Canton had just bought themselves a championship. Forced to reinvent themselves, Maslin went for broke. The Tigers immediately signed two of the toughest players in the game, John and Ted Nesser. They were universally feared for their crushing style of play. Chris Bevan. You know, they, they were really hard-nosed, blue-collar guys that, uh, you know, that loved playing the game. Newt Rockney, later regarded as one of the greatest coaches in college football history, said, getting hit by a Nesser is like falling off a moving train. Remember, no one was wearing pads at this time. A century later, Tony Gonzalez and Donald Driver know exactly what Newt meant. You know, going against someone like Terrell Suggs is a beast. Uh, Willie McGinnis is a beast. John Lynch hit me so hard, popped my helmet off my head, my earpiece and everything kind of shattered. You feel like you got hit by a car the next day. You feel it. You really do. And John asked me, he said, Donald, you okay? And I kind of just slapped his hand out of the way. I was like, man, hell no, I'm not okay. They also brought in disgraced Case Western star Peggy Parrott to play quarterback. The college wonderkind was now poised to become a professional superstar. And Parrott had been working on something few people had ever seen before. He called it the forward pass. Here's quarterback Aaron Rodgers. I'll, I'll describe it by, by a sensation in other sports that people might be relating to. It's when you square up a, a baseball on the barrel of the bat, and when you swing, you don't feel anything. It's when you have a jump shot that just comes off so perfect and swishes, and you don't feel anything, and it's effortless almost, which is the opposite of what's going on because there's so much effort that goes into it and, and micro muscular movements that allow you to achieve that perfect pass. But it, it is, uh, it's so second nature where the muscle memory takes over that you just don't feel anything. Yeah, Maslin was about to redefine the game of football yet again. Here's Sally Jenkins and Eli Manning. Without the invention of the forward pass, it, it, there really isn't an NFL. There's no way that the, the evolution of football in Pennsylvania and Ohio would have been of any interest to anyone outside of a steel mill. So I give a lot of credit to those early quarterbacks. Uh, you know, it's, it's a much fatter, kind of shorter, rounder ball. It's almost like throwing a basketball. It's not, it's not easy just to grip it, let alone trying to throw it. The 1906 season was a huge success for Canton. They outscored their opponents 285 to zero. But that's nothing compared to what Maslin did. 
Maslin went on to defeat all of its opponents by an astonishing 438 to zero. Eight games into the season, both Canton and Maslin remained undefeated. Both teams dominated. It was almost impossible to beat them. And they were just beating everybody by 50 points. In this era, teams played each other only once, but these two teams were playing football by their own rules. Unlike amateur teams, they needed a lot of money to stay in the game, and most of that came from ticket sales. Here's NFL Hall of Famer Leroy Butler. It wasn't unprecedented to them play a lot of games because they had to have revenue. The more games we played, the more money you could make. So this set up this huge two-game series at the end of the 1906 season. Once again, the Ohio championship would come down to this all-too-familiar face-off. The orange and black of the Maslin Tigers and the red and white of the Canton Athletic Club. Canton would host game one on November 16th, and Maslin would host game two on November 24th. The financial futures of both teams depended on these games. For two weeks before the first game, Canton coach Blondie Wallace sequestered his team at Penn State University, running drill after drill after drill. When Canton finally emerged from their training seclusion, they also had a new name, the Bulldogs. November 16th, 1906 finally arrives. Canton is overrun. Trainloads of people pour into town by the thousands. Offices, stores, and factories throughout the area close. There's no point in remaining open. Everyone has just one thing on their minds. Watching the Bulldogs and the Tigers battle it out in the first of two games to decide the Ohio League championship. 8,000 fans came out, which was an unheard of attendance figure at that time, you know, when most pro games were getting about 500 to 1,000 fans. Well, when Camp and Maslin played, I mean, it was, there was an awful lot of local hype. It became, you know, the event of the year, but it was more than just, you know, another game. It was more about civic pride. It was putting your town colors on the line. The winner of these games won't merely be the best team in the region. More than half a century before the creation of the Super Bowl, they will arguably be the greatest team in the nation. Football's first great rivalry promises to be a showdown for the ages. If Joe Buck had been around back then, things might have sounded like this. Well, folks, the crowd gathering to watch today's game here at Mahaffey Park is absolutely insane. Get this, the Bell Telephone Company has actually stationed their people throughout the ground so they can telegraph plays as they happen across the country. There was heavy betting. People uh, speculated afterwards that, you know, businesses came and went as a result of how they bet on that game. The stats the gamblers are using give the edge to the Canton Bulldogs. But numbers don't win games. People do. And the Bulldogs' 35-yard field goal sails straight through the upright. Beneath partly cloudy skies with just a hint of snow, the Canton Bulldogs draw first blood. Canton is on the board first. Bulldogs four, Tigers zero. Football at this time is still very much a work in progress. Field goals are worth four points and touchdowns only five. Maslin does not allow Canton any other points for the remainder of the first half. But they don't score either. Soon after the second half begins, Canton scores a touchdown, building up a 10-0 lead over Maslin. The Ohio League Championship has slipped through Canton's fingers the last few years, and they are determined that this season will be different. But then, suddenly... It's a Canton fumble! Maslin has recovered the ball, and they're racing downfield. I don't think anyone is going to be able to touch him. He's at the 45, 35, 25, 15, touchdown! Maslin is finally on the scoreboard, 10-5. The crowd at Canton holds their breath. The momentum seems to have shifted to the Tigers. If Maslin manages to score just one more touchdown, they'll tie the game. But the clock's not on the Tigers' side. They don't have enough time to stage a comeback. In the end, Maslin falls to Canton. And Canton is euphoric. The city erupts in parties that last well into the early morning hours. They need just one more victory to be champions. Assuming nothing goes wrong. The rematch is held just over a week later. Nearly 10,000 spectators from across the country descend on tiny Maslin. 
There's pictures of it where the literally the fans are on top of trolley cars that you know, delivers them to uh, Maslin Field. It looks like all of Ohio is here today, folks. Every seat is sold, and I can see hundreds of people are perched on top of the walls surrounding the field. It's like putting your finger in a light socket. It's uh, it's electrifying. The engines are revved up, and they're running faster than usual. There is no tomorrow. You got to leave it all out there on the field. The final game of the season is played at Maslin's Hospital Grounds Field, right next to the Ohio State Mental Asylum. It's fitting because it seems, even before the first punt, that the game has descended into madness. What in the world is going on here? It looks as if Canton coach Blondie Wallace is accusing the Tigers of something. He looks absolutely furious. It looks like it has something to do with the game ball. Here's former NFL referee Mike Pereira with some insight on how it works today. There is a standard ball, but it doesn't mean that all of the balls are exactly the same because each team can inflate their own footballs. And when the officials check them, as long as they are uh, between 11 and a half and 12 and a half pounds per square inch, they're okay. Now, we all know that using smaller deflated balls might get you in trouble, but not back then. So that's exactly what Maslin did. They provided smaller and lighter game balls than the ones they normally used. Wallace's protests fall on deaf ears. They have no choice but to agree to play with Maslin's gear. And the reason for Maslin's smaller and lighter footballs soon becomes very obvious. Uh, we have some last minute substitutions here. Tiger fans expecting Peggy Parrott starting at quarterback are gonna be disappointed. It looks like he's starting as an end today. And what's this? Homer Davidson, the team kicker who hasn't played a single minute of football this season is starting at quarterback. Remember, this is the era in which kicking, not throwing, is how the game's played. And Homer Davidson is the best kicker in football. The smaller, lighter ball combined with Davidson's powerful leg gives the Tigers' defense strong field position each time he punts. At halftime, the Tigers lead 5-0. But when the teams take the field again, Canton returns with a vengeance. After a pretty quiet first half with just a single Massillon touchdown, the Canton Bulldogs look re-energized. That drive just put them in. Inspired by Peggy Parrott's history-making forward pass a few weeks earlier, the Bulldogs have also secretly been practicing the forward pass. And they deploy it now with mixed results. Eli Manning. Hey, every time you throw a pass, uh, three things can happen, and two of them are bad. As one of the few guys to have actually made a forward pass in professional football, Parrott probably has an edge when it comes to picking them off. And Parrott makes his third interception of the day. For Eager to retake the lead, Maslin begins an ambitious drive all the way down the field. Then, disaster strikes. Fumble. Oh, my God. The Tigers just fumbled the ball on Canton. It's starting to look like Canton is going to win yet again. But when Canton's next drive stalls... Canton's kicker lines up for the punt deep in his own end zone. He takes the snap, and it's loose. The ball is loose. There's a scramble, and Canton recovers, but it's a safety. The Tigers get a safety, and just like that, Massillon is back on top. The wind goes out of the Bulldogs' sails after that. After another Tigers touchdown, the end is clear. Massillon wins, 13 to six, and the Tigers have pulled it off. What a game. The Tigers and Bulldogs split the final two games of the season. That night, jubilant Tigers fans carry torches through the streets. Back in Canton, the mood is decidedly more dark. Players literally busted through the uh, uh, window of the Cortland Hotel bar, uh, and angry words were exchanged, punches were thrown, and the brawl progressed out into the streets. And that really kind of set the tone uh, for the belief that the game was fixed when people were so emotionally upset by it, uh, obviously financially upset by it too, but it literally took the uh, Canton police to break it up in the streets. The whispers of scandal that started in bars and spilled into the streets that night will engulf both teams, bringing the Ohio League to its knees, derailing professional football itself. 
The morning after the final canton Maslin matchup, the people of Ohio wake to a state torn in two. Chris Willis, again. There's this rumor that starts to come out, mainly started by Ed Stewart, the team manager for Maslin. He used his newspaper to accuse Canton of fixing the game so they could play a third game in order to make out with more money. Stewart alleged that Walter East, a former Tiger who'd been fired a few games earlier, offered some of his fellow Maslin players a bribe to throw their first game. And worse, Stewart said Canton coach Blondie Wallace was the one who told East to do it. So all of a sudden, the fans in both cities and around the state of Ohio is up in arms. Now they think the games are fixed. There's a lot of rumors just bouncing around. Wallace may have been a great coach, but with or without proof, he was hardly a Boy Scout. He was well known in Canton as someone who loved taverns, prostitutes, and friends with less than stellar reputations. Given all that, some wondered, was it so hard to believe that he had tried to fix the games with Maslin? The scandal was all anyone was talking about, and the fans felt cheated. In the end, it was impossible to tell who, if anyone, was to blame. But whatever the truth, the game of professional football had been sullied. It brought the entire sport down. It just sort of ruined the reputation that these players only play for money, that they were willing to fix or rig games for their uh, own pockets. These were the two best teams in pro football with the best players, and it just left a bad taste in, in some people's mouths. NFL commissioner Roger Goodell knows this history. The single most important thing uh, is protecting the integrity of the game. You know, there's all kinds of sports scandals that involve uh, gambling at times. It's our number one concern uh, how we protect the public confidence of the game. When the scandal in uh, 06 broke, Canton just wasn't able to you know, survive it. They literally uh, just had to you know, stop playing professional football. It, in fact, impacted all of the sport because the, the idea of it being a less than reputable game uh, meant that that probably was happening elsewhere. Coach Blondie Wallace filed a libel claim against the Maslin newspaper that accused him of fixing the game and ultimately settled out of court. John and Ted Nesser put on their work boots and went back to the factories. Peggy Parrott played one last year with Maslin before seeking his fortunes with whatever club would pay his fare. After that, the Tigers officially folded. No doubt those in their white Ivy League towers saw this implosion as a vindication. After all, what do people expect? This is exactly what happens when you allow the poor, the working class, and foreign immigrants to play an elite game. It appeared that professional football was dead. But 300 miles away is a 17-year-old Native American boy stepping onto a football field for the very first time. He's not dressed for the game. He doesn't know the rules. But he knows what he wants, to play football. His name is Jim Thorpe, and despite their best efforts, no one on the field that day is able to tackle him. No one even touches him. Young Jim Thorpe, soon to be the best player the game has ever seen, is embarking on a journey that will change American football forever. This season on American football, as the United States races into the 20th century, professional football will generate new teams and new rivalries. As the game's popularity grows, so do the titanic power struggles, shady backroom deals, and political backstabbing. It will surge from the desolate prairies of Ohio to the icy waters of Green Bay, from the windy avenues of Chicago to the Great White Way of New York. Star players like George Hallis, Red Grange, Fritz Pollard, and Curly Lambeau will cement their names in history and create an empire called the National Football League. I'm Kate Mara. This is American Football. <laughs>